Well, hello, this is Adam. Welcome again to Rare Classic Cars. We have, I guess, my popular demand, right? Mark again? Uh, it, it, however you would like to phrase it. I'm going to, I'm a passive player in this one. You're a passive player, mm, okay. Yes. Very, very true. Well, Mark is with a Mark IV, so how yeah, uh, Mark's with a Mark. It's the Mark IV, yes. And I have my 72 Continental. So, so it's two Continentals for the price of one. That's right. And two 72s. The, the Continentals for 1972. Meet the Continentals. So Mark and I thankfully have two 1972 Lincolns, two different body styles here, both black exterior, although... As Henry Ford said, any color as long as it's black. That's very true. Best exemplified, although you do have a red interior in yours. I have a black I do interior. have some dash of color, but then you also have a, not quite matching, but another vehicle because you also have a 1972 Continental Mark IV in a more lively hue, shall we say. Yes, I think it's uh, Gold Glamour Metallic. Uh, or... I don't even no, want no, to sorry, know yeah. what it is. That was the Ford name. It was Yellow Gold Moon Dust was the Lincoln name. Sure, for it. I'll buy that. Okay. <laughs> So welcome, we're going to talk about the design of the various vehicles, the features, obviously two range toppers for Ford in 1972, but so different in so many ways. Mark's going to describe all the differences from the design standpoint. We'll talk back and forth about some of the features. There is so much history between these cars here, or in these cars, and they're so significant in so many ways. So they could, you could make this a 10 part, but I think you'll lose viewers. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot to talk about with these cars are very significant. Uh, so first of all, I have to do my disclaimer again because yes. again, uh, again, I display, uh, I make a disclaimer at every uh, beginning of every video because I work at General Motors and uh, it's our policy, the company, to always disclose that when we do any sort of public speaking or anything that reaches the public. Uh, we're supposed to make sure that any viewing audience is aware of that. We're not talking about General Motors today at all. No, so you you must and, not yeah, like these vehicles. Uh, I like them all. I'm an equal opportunity collector. I like them all. <laughs> I don't care here. what brand's on there. If I like the car, I like the car. And I don't care who made it, <laughs> as long as I like the car. So um, just like you, I've got, you've got Mopars, you've got Ford, you've got GM, you've got AMC. I don't have the AMC portion, like you got that. You need to fill that I, gap in yeah, your collection. We discussed my uh, Plymouth Fury a few weeks ago. That set off a few interesting Well, you're comments. a designer, so you would like the Matador Coupe. That's probably what you're holding out for. Uh, this is already enough of a guilty pleasure for a designer. I'll talk about this in a moment, so let's not go there. <laughs> anyway, we're talking Lincoln Continentals and Continentals today, and this is a really, really interesting topic, so I hope your viewers will enjoy this one. All right, well, let's get started. Okay. All right, so let's get started with my 72 Continental here, which, by the way, is the Lincoln Continental, not just the Continental, mm -hmm. as you see on the headlight door there. Yep. But This car I have I bought not that long ago, probably about six months ago, and it was on a site called OfferUp, and actually a viewer sent it to me, and the reason why I bought it is because it's a coupe, a 72 coupe, which they made about 10,500-ish coupes, and it was black, which there are about 300 of the 10,000 that were painted black, and it had a black interior, and of the 300, I think 150 have the black interior, and it has no vinyl roof, which is super rare for these. No vinyl roof, no body side molding appearance protection group, no bumper guards in the front, no pinstripe. So very, very rare color combination, plus rare, I would say, configuration for this Trim car. Trim configuration on this car, yes. Exactly. And, and because of that, it's also probably the one regular Lincoln that year, the one regular Lincoln Continental, it's the closest in spirit to the Continental Mark IV. It is. It's obviously much bigger, or at least the wheelbase is bigger. Yes, by about uh, seven inches or so, isn't it? That's right. 127-inch wheelbase for this one, 120-inch wheelbase for the Mark IV. And, and the overall length between the two of them is just about 220 for the Mark IV, and I think 225 for the... That is correct. Yep. ...for the uh, Lincoln Continental. So you get a little bit more size and a very different design theme. This one is... I don't know how you would describe it. Mark will do a better job describing the vehicles, but I thought something about this, just this all black car with no vinyl roof, so rare to see one with no vinyl roof. And it makes the lines of the vehicle just, I think, yeah. elongated. I have to admit, when you first brought it here some, some months ago, I was absolutely flabbergasted because I had never seen one in the flesh that didn't have the padded, uh, the vinyl top. I've only ever seen these cars with vinyl top, and the fact that yours has vinyl top delete is really, really unique, again. 
<laughs> uh, and extremely rare to see. And there's another thing. Um, the Lincoln Continental was, of course, a luxury car, and it wasn't a ubiquitous car. It was not something you saw every day at every street corner, but it was a mass-produced American automobile. The Mark IV was supposed to be the exclusive play, the more, the more upscale play. But when you look at the production numbers, the regular <laughs> coupe true. was 10,000. This was 49,000 units for 1972. So you have five times as many uh, Mark IV coupes are two doors in the, in, in the population than you have the regular Lincoln. Which is interesting, too, because the base price of this 72 Continental was 7172 according to the window sticker I have. And the Mark IV was 8813 mm -hmm. base price. Yeah. Well, so. the Mark IV was competing with the Cadillac Eldorado. Uh. And so this was Ford's entry or Lincoln's entry in the Eldorado space, and it was similar. The Eldorado was a very expensive vehicle. It was more expensive than the regular, you know, sedan or coupe, coupe uh, de villes. And uh, so this was an exclusivity play. And ironically, of course, uh, it was, from a sheer numbers point of view, not that exclusive at all. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But this, this I think, is an interesting, I mean, interesting vehicle and because it has the no vinyl roof. And then the black interior was also quite Rare too, and this is just the standard cloth bench seat brocade interior. And it has the three spoke non cruise, in this case, non tilt as well, steering wheel with the rim blow feature, which Marks also has, where you pinch the rim and you honk the horn. So you go around the corner and you tend to honk the horn. Yeah, they could have called it pinch and, and honk as well. <laughs> pinch and honk, that's right. And it does have a we'll see a very different interior this has the rotating drum speedometer and Marx has a much more driver centric cockpit with square gauges another thing that's remarkable about your vehicle not just the very special uh, specking of this vehicle but also just the uh, the character it has is because you don't have uh, the usual uh, trim items, you don't have the, the rub strips, you don't have the door edge guards, you don't have the vinyl top, you don't have all the moldings that go with the vinyl top. Um, it has practically, I would say, an even more stealth quality than uh, the Mark IV has from certain angles, just because the roof is so um, severe and so massive. This whole car I would characterize as, as massive uh, how would you how would you characterize this car from a design point of view? I would say massive formality is probably <laughs> the best descriptor for this car because it is enormous and it's very formal. Uh, it's very dignified. It's also very conventional. We were talking about the Pontiacs uh, in the previous video yes. and the fast roof lines on the coupes and the sedan too. This one has a sort of hybrid. It's got a somewhat elegant flow of the... Uh, rear uh, upper into the deck lid, but it also has a very thick, massive C pillar, and everything is very stately. So this is an interesting mix of flowing design elements and very stately, massive, blocky shapes. It's very, you know, I think what's interesting too is this is obviously not a copy in any sense of the El Dorado of the era. It's very not different. At all. It's kind of, I guess, a a version or a riff on the 61 Continental a little bit? It is. Th this is one of the interesting lineages that go through these vehicles, especially um, for Ford, uh, Ford's repeated attempt to establish the Continental or Lincoln and then Lincoln Continental as a viable player in the luxury car field because that was always something that Ford struggled with. Cadillac and early in earlier times Packard were the big guys but then after World War II it really was Cadillac 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 Packard kind of dropped out of sight by the early 50s it wasn't that relevant anymore and uh, Lincoln never really quite got off the ground so Ford and the Ford family were attempting to relaunch a continental brand uh, some of your viewers will be very familiar with that story um, there was an enormous amount of money spent and a beautiful uh, American quote-unquote Rolls-Royce designed for these mm. newly created continental division for 1956 they were so massively over engineered and expensive to make that Ford lost a purported ten thousand dollars per car and they cost ten thousand dollars so right. um, they were super highly uh, uh, over engineered and over contented and they could not make any money on it. Lost, they lost oodles of cash on this and so it was shut down after only two model years, uh, 56 and 57. But the Continental 
as an attempt to reestablish the brand as a relevant player remained. So these are really um, the more successful iterations that followed in the late 60s, of course. The reboot was in 1968 and a half or 1969 with the Continental Mark III. That's right. And this is, this is a full body on frame car that 61 was a unibody car uh, as well. Well, we were not even talking about the 61 because the 56 was a body on frame design. That was a very conventionally engineered car with some very interesting engineering features. The 61 was sort of the last hurrah. It was, uh, the story goes that Robert McNamara, who before he became part of the uh, Kennedy administration government in 1961, he was of course the, uh, he was you, Adam, at Ford Motor <laughs> Company. He was the, the big That's why uh, all those 61s had two barrel carburetors mm -hmm, as well. And uh, some other, no, I, and, and I want to just mention that Mr. McNamara was very fond of the Ford Falcon. Okay, that was his favorite product oh, <laughs> for Ford Company. Wow. But I think uh, the story goes that Lincoln's uh, fate ha hung in the balance a little bit because they never really made money and they never really established themselves as a viable alternative to Cadillac in the market. And so the 61 Continental, along with a companion Thunderbird, were sort of the last attempt to make that brand viable again. And they consolidated all the different models into basically two models, the, the sedan and the convertible, based on the same unibody structure that the Ford Thunderbird was using, built at the uh, Wixom, the now defunct Ford Wixom plant here in Michigan, that was initially conceived in the 1950s as a specialized plan for unitized construction. That's right. Now this, this particular Continental, Ford had this kind of coffin nosy theme that went on for a number of years that also spilled into the Mercury's of the era. Well, these cars are uh, probably the most significant representation of this new formalism, the new conservatism of formalism that really started with the 1969 Mark III. And the, the story goes that whether he was inebriated or sober, we don't know, but Lee Iacocca called up Gene Bordenay and said, put me a Rolls Royce Grill in a Thunderbird. Gene Bordenay, Ford's uh, Gene design Bordenay chief. Gene Bordenay was Ford's design chief, and Iacocca had certain ideas, he had certain obsessions and ideas. We talked about this a little bit when we did the Plymouth video, how Virgil Exner had certain things he was obsessed with, and Iacocca had certain things he was obsessed with. He was not a designer, but he was definitely a great marketer, and he had a great, great feeling, at least at the time in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when he was uh, uh, important at Ford Motor Company, he had a great feeling for what sells. He had sort of these inspirations. and. One of these inspirations was, you know, he called up his chief designer and said, put me a Rolls Royce Glenn the Thunderbird. Um, and as a designer, I have to say that loving these cars is almost a guilty pleasure because they violate every rule in, uh, in the book about good taste and how things are done properly in the design world. And it was also said that at the time at the Ford Design Department, uh, the team under Gene Bordney then, was resisting with all their might against Lee Iacocca's meddling and his inspirations that he wanted to see turned into reality, like fake spare tire humps and, and, and padded coach <laughs> roofs and, and, and full Rolls Royce grills. But uh, from a sales and, and a marketing point of view, Iacocca was of course proven right. These cars were a spectacular success and putting a knockoff uh, pseudo-British Rolls Royce cliche grill on these cars became an obnoxious obsession and fad that basically influenced all American cars in the 1970s into the 80s and well beyond. By the 70s, it had morphed into some kind of Mercedes uh, knockoff because Mercedes was the other famous European car company that used a traditional stand-up grill. Mm. Um, but to put these cliches on American cars was must have been revolting to the designers. At least that's how the story goes. But of course, Iacocca prevailed. He succeeded. It worked here. It didn't quite work when he tried to do the same thing with the K car. Imperial. That is exactly right. So <laughs> it had outlived its usefulness and it was had by that time become a bad joke and he insisted on doing it but probably because it worked so well the first time around <laughs> and it was very successful and he kept on doing it. That's not unusual for people who have a lot of success with one gig or another and they keep trying to apply the same formula over and over again and eventually it runs itself out and, and fizzles. Well, let's talk about some of the differences in the front end treatment and themes and maybe the overall styling. Yes. So the interesting differences here are that um, the Lincoln Continental, your vehicle, the regular full-size sedan, plays up the richness and the complexity. It has a lot of decorative embellishments on the front end. Uh, 
They both have concealed headlights. This was sort of the tail end of the concealed headlight era. And Lincoln was one of the last uh, car brands that actually had them. Because Ford kept it, yeah, till the Ford 70, kept it for the 70s. 70s. Ford kept them on their top line models. They kept the concealed headlamps. Um, they did not have them on the Thunderbird, even though the Thunderbird received them briefly in, in 1967 through uh, 1971, the Thunderbird had concealed headlights. But uh, after that- It came that, back in the late 70s. It came back in the late 70s on the, uh, the Fox, uh, Fox-based one. No, actually 77, the, uh, the Toronto-based ones as well. So they were on and off with that. Of course, um, on your car, the interesting difference is that while there's a strong formality, you know, in these very uh, blocky shapes and these massive uh, grill elements, you have embellishing grills. There's a lot of um, entertainment going on in the grill texture. There is a major texture with a minor texture inset inside. You have a repeat of that texture on the uh, headlamp doors. That's an interesting way to describe it. You kind of have the rectangle, like squares yeah, within a rectangle. A, it's a major minor plate, which is a very typical um, approach to give something richness. You want some organization, you don't want chaos, so you mm. create a major uh, element, and the major element is the, the big grid. Right, the big, the large uh, framing of it, and then you have the minor element, which is a re repeating motif, but it's scaled scale. differently, and it adds structure and organization, and makes it look organized uh, while still adding sort of complexity and visual interest. And that's one way to keep um, an audience engaged and interested. And it's so you also have, like you said, you have the theme repeating on the headlight doors mm -hmm. here. You don't on the yeah. Mark, because you have the central Rolls-Royce-esque The Mark IV is an entirely different play, and there's a lot of subtle differences between those cars and how this is done here. For instance, let's start with the badging. This one just says Continental. Yours says Lincoln Continental, and that's an important difference because it plays into Ford's marketing strategy. They weren't quite sure how to position Continental versus Lincoln. Is it a Lincoln? Is it a Lincoln Continental? Is it a Continental? Is it a Mark? Uh, later in the 1980s, the Mark VII series actually lost the Lincoln Continental designation, eventually just uh -huh. became a Lincoln Mark VII, right? Remember that? So they were clearly focusing on the Lincoln brand. In those days, they weren't sure whether they were going to focus on the Lincoln brand or the Continental part of the brand. So there's a little bit of, if not confusion, a little bit of bias between the Mark series and the regular full-size cars. And you did get a different hood ornament, different Lincoln emblem for Everything the Mark IV. Everything is a little different. You have a vertically oriented, uh, very slim, very fragile looking uh, Lincoln uh, emblem here. And on your car, it's actually quite chunky. And they and even have on the wheel covers on mine, the on really the wheel covers, old. Everything is a little different. So there is some differentiation, which is important to marketers and, and, and advertising to build the brand equity and build the brand awareness. You want to strike the right balance between what, where the differences are and what the main message is. And um, on these cars, I think there's enough similarities in character that uh, makes it clear that it's one brand. But Continental is probably the sub-brand. If you had to decide what's dominant and what's the sub-brand, mm. I think Continental is the sub-brand. But here you have the turn signals integrated kind of into the fender form as well. As a designer, as I mentioned, um, this is a bit of a guilty pleasure because of all these, what we would call kitsch cliches of, you know, <laughs> fake Rolls-Royce grills and whatnot. But many of my colleagues agree, even though many, a few are, are bold enough to admit it, but designers love the Mark IV, the 72 Mark IV. Uh, this is also the last year before American cars or any car sold in North America became molested by five mile per hour bumpers. And that really changed, unfortunately, the game uh, when it came to th questions of elegance and being able to integrate um, bumper shapes beautifully into the car. This was the last year. And this is significant because the Mark IV really works best as the 1972, the one year only. In 1973, they had to have five mile per hour bumpers in the front. That's sort of, to many um, people, that ruins the front end of the Mark IV. And then in 1974, they had to have them front and back, so that included a significant redesign. And then you also, in the back in 74, you lost, consequently, the bumper form that carried Correct. the Yes. The so one of the significant cup. things both, which both of these cars have is a very unified, smooth, integrated look. So there's very, very little um, over uh, over flushness of the bumpers. The bumpers are almost flush with the body, which is one of the reasons why we got five mile per hour bumpers anyway. Because <laughs> from the mid 60s to the early 70s, having bumper shelves, uh, protrusions from the bumpers that actually give protections and kind of minor 
minor collisions or mi minor bumps, uh, those weren't trendy. Uh, the designers tried to achieve a very unified, smooth, integrated look. And that, of course, as, together with these very complicated pointy plan views, the W shapes that we talked about in the Pontiac video, you had a lot of points that could inflict a lot of damage. And that was one of the reasons why insurance companies lobbied for the five mile per hour uh, uh, regulations that in, in the end didn't do anything for our insurance rates, but uh, you know, created an awful lot of complexity and went, went into the cars. You could have at least gotten the bumper guard on your Mark IV too to protect your the, You mean the grill guard? Grill guard. The grill, the grill guard. guard. Yes, Fair there's, a, there's, a, there's a grill guard, which this car had. I took it off and plugged the hole that was in it because I don't like the grill guard. This is another feature that's interesting because this is probably the most dramatic presentation of the fake Rolls-Royce grill or the Lincoln interpretation or the Continental interpretation of Rolls-Royce by having such a deep cut into the bumper shape, you have a very, very vertical, very formal, very classic appearance. Uh, this car is all about the verticality and the front end, which go goes against all the designer's credos. We talked about this too, about the wider theme where, where everything right. is emphasized horizontally. This one goes to a vertical emphasis down to the details like how the badge is shaped versus the regular full-size car where it has a chunkier, wider appearance. So everything here has subtle upgrades to play up the design theme of this car. And vertical reminds you of cathedral spires, of classical buildings that are very tall and, and sort of uh, they, they go into impossible heights. And that's one of, the, one of the design cues you can deploy in order to create a feeling of substance and sort of old, old world um, seriousness and, and uh, exclusivity and upmarket appeal. Um, another thing that's interesting is that everything is nice and smoothly integrated. So we talked about the, uh, the uh, turn signal uh, lenses here. And uh, of course it has cornering lamps and, and reflectors as well. Uh, everything is very, very smoothly integrated. Everything is very stealth. This car is super reduced. It doesn't have any embellishments on the headlamp doors. Everything is supposed to look extremely reduced, which is the opposite of your car. The form is so different too on the body side. Here you kind yeah. of have a a higher, what would you call the crease line there? Well, yes, the, the body side crease or the, the, uh, the separation it's between the upper and the lower. It's much higher than it curves in much yes, further inward. The, uh, the, uh, the Mark IV car. was actually a rather curvy car with a very crisply delineated outline. So it had a very, one of the last cars in the market that had an Oldsmobile Tornado-like fender uh, approach uh. because it had this very prominent flange and this very elegantly modeled uh, fender blister that uh, defined the wheelhouses. That was one of the last applications of this uh, kind of uh, wheelhouse design for some years that kind of went away a little bit when the sheer look came in that, uh, that Bill Mitchell favored in the mid 70s. So this one actually has a lot of elegant sweeps and curves. It's quite simple and very dramatic at the same time. And you also have the wheel cover has, there's, there's Various interpretations, yeah. whether that's a racing nut or it's so, uh, a Parkinson's. One back. of our friends insisted that this was supposed to be a reference to a center uh, lug here. Um, I am, I find it a stretch <laughs> on a car like this, but who knows? Uh, again, the hallmark here is extreme utmost simplicity, a very, very simple wheel cover, very elegant looking, very formal and traditional, but very elegant. Again, reduction of elements. This car is actually, in spite of its somewhat kitschy cues it has here and that are very dominant about the design theme, the execution of the car is actually on the very, very subdued and, and, and uh, low-key side, down to the scaling of the badging. If you look at uh, the size of the badges, it's very reduced, very small font, um, and even the detailing, like the etched uh, Continental logos and all this stuff, is, it's very delicate. It's um, supposed to evoke uh, this sort of exclusive boutique feeling to the car. Interesting. One of the things that's nice about uh, these cars is that by the standards of the day, these are, at least in the body, they are very well made. Um, they have excellent stampings. The quality of the uh, metal work is quite outstanding. The quality of the paint is outstanding. Uh, our cars have original paint. It is beautiful. It's, it's shiny and rich. Uh, doesn't, I mean, my car has a few more dings than yours. It's a little higher mileage, but for original paint, it's just an amazing quality. The fit and finish, the evenness of the gaps. In spite of yours being a, a glorified Torino. 
Well, then there's that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I was hoping you wouldn't bring this up, but um, <laughs> this is another interesting thing. This is already a, a severely cost cut car in the sense that uh, Ford cashed in on the success of the Mark III, which was based on the Thunderbird, mm -hmm. but it was also the expensive uh, upscale Thunderbird. The Thunderbird was um, a car that was positioned in the near luxury field. It was quite expensive, a very expensive Ford. Sort of cost, uh, uh, the cost of a T-Bird was sort of just a few hundred dollars below a Lincoln, really. Mm. It was an upscale. So, um, and once the Mustang came out, and even the Cougar came out, once the pony cars and, and uh, the muscle car-based coup coupes came out in the late 60s, the Thunderbird dropped off in popularity quite significantly. And it became a little too complex and expensive, so um, they were uh, cashing in with the Mark III, and now they wanted to take the cachet that they had built with the Mark III and, and make even more money on the Mark IV and the Mark V series. And they did that by putting that platform or that model on the midsize platform, the Torino and the Montego platform, which a lot of people don't believe, but it's true. They're, they're using a significant amount of Montego and Torino parts in the chassis and the body. And one of the things where you can tell the difference is that what we call the glass barrel, which is the sweep and curvature of the glass, and you see it really in the A-pillar, Compare that to a 72 Torino or Montego and you'll find it has exactly the same character. There's probably the same tools even for the windshield, definitely the same, same tools for the side glass because it's based on the same chassis. Mm. Whereas the regular Lincoln is a bigger body and a different body and has actually different sweeps and, and, uh, and parts for this hardware. Interesting. Yeah. Let's take a quick pause and we'll do a little bit more detail then. We'll be right back. Hope you enjoyed this first installment of a comparison between the 1972 Continentals, the Lincoln Continental Coupe, and the Continental Mark IV. If you did, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve this up to more viewers like you. If you really liked it, please hit the super thanks button, which is the heart-shaped icon with a dollar sign in it at the bottom right of your video browser. And check out some video thumbnails at the bottom left and right for some suggestions for you until part two comes along. Stay tuned for part two coming shortly.